Okay, hello everybody. We're back. And today we are starting kind of a new chapter uh, in the course. And this chapter is actually uh, not directly related to uh, Python FLTK. So it is going to be a slight tangent, but it is a topic that is important and we have to learn this. Um, but I will try and tie it back into FLTK later. So I think what we should start off is define what is recursion. So in order to start this, I think what I'm going to do is just review functions a little bit. So let's start off with a function. Let's say we make a function uh, called foo. And we have lines inside this function. And then let's also make a function called bar. Now, we know that, let's say we have some lines in here. And in this function, if we call bar, then we know that if we, in some other place in the code, if we call foo, then control goes up to here and then all these lines start being executed and when we get to this function call we can call a function from within a function and so control of the program will go to the function bar and these lines will be executed and when this bar function is finished then control will go back to the next line in foo. Now this isn't unexpected. We already know this and we've already learned this. But recursion deals with the situation where what if the function you call is the same function? So essentially let's say we have the function foo here and we call foo from within itself. Now, you could end up with what's called uh, you know, an infinite recursive situation in this, if, if you did this. And um, essentially, like, if you called foo from somewhere else, right, in the, in the global scope, then uh, outside of the function and then okay so this line executes first and then these lines execute and then you get to here and then control goes back up to here and then these lines execute and then control goes back up to here these lines execute and you can see now we're in an infinite loop so this is like a pit this is a pitfall of recursion and we have to make sure this doesn't happen but you might say well if this is if this is simply behaving as a loop then we have already learned how to write loops for example we know how to write for loops we know how to write while loops why not just use these instead of using this odd way of making a loop that behaves by calling itself and the answer is that's fine you could use this method However, some problems in computer science or in the world lend themselves to being solved by recursive solutions very elegantly. And so right now we're going to I'm going to describe what types of problems these are. So let's take a look at an example of factorial okay so first of all we should say you know what is factorial if you haven't learned it before uh, factorial if you have a calculator actually uh, we do and I'll bring it up okay so factorial of X is defined as in in math it's defined with an X exclamation mark and so if we take let's say the factorial of one the number one 
that's going to equal a 1. And I can show you on the calculator here, if I type in 1 and then hit factorial button, the answer is still 1. Well, what about the factorial of 2? So if I hit 2 and I hit factorial, the answer is 2. So, so far it doesn't seem very interesting. What about the factorial of 3? The factorial of 3 is 6. Okay, that's different. The factorial of 4 is equal to 24. Oh, that's very different. So, what about, let's do this one more, let's do one more here. What's the factorial of 5? So, that is 120. So, now I'm going to show you how this ends up working. So, the factorial of 5 is equal to 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And by the way, I mean, you could change this order to make it 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5. Multiplication is commutative, so it doesn't matter in which order you multiply things. Now, what's the factorial of 4? It's 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. The factorial of 3 is 3 times 2 times 1. The factorial of 2 is equal to 2 times 1. And the factorial of 1, well, is that equal to 1 times 1? Or is it just 1? So this one is kind of... Uh, a, a special case because we're really not multiplying anything. And if you look at all the solutions here, okay, so you remember I said that there is types of problems which lend themselves to recursive solutions. So what I'd like you to do is take a look at these solutions here and see if you can spot some type of a pattern so to speak some kind of a uh, a repeated structure to each consecutive solution and w specifically what I want you to look at is take a look here this 2 times 1 do you see it anywhere else? Yep, I see it right here. Uh-huh. So, well, what about this 3 times 2 times 1? Do you see this structure anywhere else? Yep, I see it right here. Well, what about this structure? The 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Yep, I see it right here. So you see there's a repeated pattern. Each successive solution contains the solution from the one before. Now, how, if, we, if we have the number 3, how would we relate it to the number 2? Well, 2 is 1 less than 3. So the way I'm going to... Now you have to wrap your head around writing a general solution. And so the general solution for a factorial ends up being that the factorial of n is equal to n times the factorial of n minus 1. And so, like, if you think about this for a minute, okay, let's take, for example, the number 3. That would say that it's equal to 3, because notice this is n, right? There's an n, there's an n, there's an n. So wherever, so we're going to replace every letter n with the number 3. 
So we'll say 3 factorial is equal to 3 times 3 minus 1 factorial. Essentially, what that says is 3 factorial is equal to 3 times, and in the brackets now, it's 2 factorial. And what's 2 factorial? Well, we know what 2 factorial is. It's defined right here as 2 times 1. So it's equal to 3 times 2 times 1. Now, why does this problem... Now, obviously, you can, I can f replace this with anyone. I didn't have to pick 3. For example, I could have you know, picked 5. 5 factorial is equal to 5 times 5 minus 1 factorial. Now, again, this you can see that's 4 factorial, and that's correct. This is 4 factorial, and so it's 5 times 4 factorial. It works out. However, the reason why this lends itself to being a recursive solution is because, and here's the key, the solution to the original problem contains the same type of problem. You know, it kind of reminds me, you know those Russian dolls where you have uh, a doll and then you have a doll inside a doll inside a doll? It's similar to that concept where in order to solve this problem, you have to solve a similar problem, which is almost identical. It's basically identical. It's just a different number. It's 4 instead of 5. And so now what you think is, OK, well, that means if I want the solution to this one, I have to calculate the solution to this one. If I want the solution to this one, I have to calculate the solution to this one. And if I want the solution to this one, I mean, e let me try and express this in a more clear way. Five depend, the solution to 5 depends on 4. The solution to 4 depends on 3. The solution to 3 depends on 2. And finally, last but not least, the solution to 2 depends on the solution to 1. So now ask yourself this. What does the solution to the 1 depend on? And the answer is nothing. Therefore, we have a special name for this. It's called the base case. Now, the base case is a solution that is defined. And what is defined is that the factorial of 1 is equal to 1. So, if that's defined, then we can write a function. Now, we can change this now into code. And the code would look something like this. We'll say def factorial, and we're going to pass it uh, a number n. And now, what comes in here is going to be, you're going to have two things in here. Okay, You're going to have a base case. And that base case is usually in the form uh, of an if statement. Okay. And so I'm just writing pseudocode at this point. And then you're going to have the recursive call, which is essentially a call to itself. So we're gonna call, we're gonna call factorial from inside. I spelt it wrong, uh, from inside this function. And also, um, we're, going to, we're, going to rec we're going to return something. OK, so it, it, this is all going to be clear once you see the solution. However, before showing you the solution, I'm going to give you a little bit of time, because I think this is valuable to try and write this function 
yourself. So I have given you some clues. If you kind of go back and look at what I had up here, specifically look at the base case and see if you can figure out what this function looks like. And then we'll come back and we'll go through the solution. However, uh, then what we'll, we'll do is we'll actually step through how the computer actually goes through this and gets to the solution. So pause the video here and try and write the function factorial. Okay, I did forget one thing, and that is that the base case also has a return statement. Okay? All right. Let's start this by going into our interpreter, and let's start by writing a function called fact for factorial, and we'll pass it uh, single integer n. And now let's actually define the base case. And the base case has to come first. So we'll say if n equals a 1, which is the base case, then simply return the answer or the solution, which is a 1. Now, if it's not a 1, now we'll actually return something different. So if, we, if it returns 1, then the function's finished, right? But if it's not a 1, then we should return. Now we have to think about what we're going to do. Remember how the solution here, how the um, recursive solution, the, the algebraic format for it, do you remember how it, what it looked like? It was right there. So it's n times n minus 1 factorial. So if I come now to my code, and I, re I say return n times. Br now, I can't express the factorial by doing exclamation mark. So I have to express it as the function call. So now I'm going to go fact. But now I'm going to pass it n minus 1. And so essentially, I'm now returning n times fact of n minus 1. And it, now you can see how I'm calling, the function is calling itself. So let's try it. What is the fact of 1? Oops. It is 1. What is the fact of 2? That's good. What about 3? That's correct. And 4? That's right. And finally, 5. And that's right. So it works. And notice, here's what I wanted to say about this, is notice how elegant the solution looks. It's, it's almost too short to, to imagine that it works properly. But that's the beauty of the factorial, or sorry, the beauty of the recursive element of it. So now that we've actually been able to program it, let's go back and figure out how the computer actually gets the solution. Okay, so let's, let's figure this out from the way the computer does this by calculating the factorial of 5. So we'll start here and we'll actually execute this and we've got the function defined. So what happens is this number 5, so this 5 gets sent to a function. Now this box represents a function. And we'll say that function is on the stack because that's where the computer, it's a, it's a computer science term we call the stack. Essentially, um, you can think of the stack as like a vertical stack of calls. And 
that square represents a function. So this function returns the number, or sorry, accepts the number 5. So the 5 goes in to this function. However, this function doesn't provide us with the answer. What it does instead is it simply does some math inside of it, but essentially what it does is it creates another function call, but this time with the number 4 being passed to the same function. So all these squares, think of them as clones. Each square is the same function. But every time you ask the, the, the function to give you an answer, it doesn't. All it does is it says, well, I don't know the answer to the factorial of 5, but let me try calling a clone of myself to give me the answer to the, to the factorial of 4. And so this does the same thing. It reduces it by 1 and calls the function again. Reduces it by 1, calls the function again. Reduces it by 1 and calls the function again. This now, this is the base case. And the base case doesn't need to call anybody else because it knows what the answer to the factorial of 1 is. It's defined. So it knows the answer. So it returns the answer and says, I know it, it's 1. So it returns the 1. This guy now multiplies the, the 2 by the 1 that it got back, and it returns, it returns a 2. This guy now is trying to multiply 3 by the answer that it's waiting for, and it gets back a 2, and so it returns a 6. This guy is waiting for the answer, which, is, which, which it gets back now, which is 6, and so it returns 24. This guy is waiting for the answer, and it finally gets it, and it finally returns 120. And that is what fact 5 produces, is 120. So notice that the, if, you, if you call this direction going down the stack, okay, this is where the stack is being created, then really no solution is being found. All that's happening is a function's calling the same function, calling the same function, but with different values every time. Finally, when we get to the base case here, that's when we start going up the stack. And when we go up the stack, we're going in this direction now. And in that case, the solution is, that's when the solution is being calculated. So now, this is where we're doing 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 on the way back up the stack. Okay? So that's what that's how the computer ends up calculating the answer. So all these function calls are memorized. And it has to go back after each function returns a value, it goes back to the previous incarnation of itself. Okay, let's try uh, another recursive problem. And remember, recursive problems are defined by the fact that each solution is, can be solved by solving the same solution, uh, a, su a sub-problem which is exactly the same as the original, like the Russian dolls again. So let's do something called Fibonacci. Now Fibonacci is a sequence of numbers and it start it's the, it also it's the holds the secret to life. And it starts with the two most basic numbers of all, 0 and 1. And now all you do is you simply add those two numbers together and you get another number. Now you take the last two numbers, add them together and you get another number. 
You take the last two numbers, add them together, and you get another. Take the last two, add them together, and get another. Last two, add them together, and you get another. Add them together, and you get another. Add them together, and you get another. And that's it. That's the Fibonacci sequence. So, I'd like you to see if you could come up with an algebraic expression that would define each um, Fibonacci sequence after 0 and 1. I'm looking for an algebraic Okay, so I mentioned that Fibonacci is the secret to all life. And that's probably an odd thing to say. And so I wanted to show you here. Uh, oops. We've got, I've just Googled Fibonacci in nature. And the Fibonacci spiral is actually uh, in so many different things. So many different things in nature, like the shell or flowers um, are have that Fibonacci sequence encoded into them. And that's why I mentioned it was the secret to all life. Somehow this Fibonacci sequence is integral to the way uh, nature produces itself. Okay, let's go back to the code. And what I wanted to mention here is that something I perhaps may have forgotten, is that each of these numbers has an index. So in other words, this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So in other words, if we, if we wanted to write a function called fib, then fib8 would return 21, OK? Um, fib 7 is going to return 13. And similarly, fib 1 is going to return 1. And fib 0 is going to return 0. So give that a shot in terms of writing the uh, algebraic equation. So the way we're going to solve this is we're going to say, well, let's take 8 for, exa for example. And you know, for this one, what is the, sol what is the solution to uh, Fibonacci of 8? Well, it's equal to the Fibonacci of 7 plus the Fibonacci of 6. Because it's, 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 it's equal to uh, 13 plus 8. And so now we can write the general form, and we can say Fib n is equal to Fib n minus 1, which is, that's how we get 8 minus 1 is 7. And then we go plus fib. Now remember, we can only use n, right? So that's n minus 2. And that is the general solution for Fibonacci. Now, question, what's the base case? Now, in this, in this situation, really, we have two numbers as the base case. But it's a very, very simple looking base case. Notice that I want you to see if you can write an if statement that will produce, that will return these values for these given inputs. Okay? And then you return the solution to the Fibonacci using a recursive call. See if you can write the function next. Pause the video now. Okay, uh, let's go and do the solution. So, in terms of 
Fibonacci, let's, uh, let's write the function as def, let's call it fib, and let's call it, let's send it also the number n. And now we're going to have to do the base case. So if we look carefully, here's the base case right there on the left. If, we, if it gets a 1, it returns a 1. If it gets a 0, it returns a 0. So let's think about how to do that. We could say if 1 return, you know, we could say if n equals 1. Or you could say, you know, if n equals 1 or n equals 0. The problem with this is they're not, it's not going to be the same value, right? But, I mean, what are we going to return, 0 or 1? But the, but the nice thing about this is what you return is, this, is the same as what you give it. Haha, -ha, that's the key. So if you get 1, you return 1. If you get 0, you return 0. So that makes it really easy. So now you could say, just return n. OK? And so that handles the base case. And now what about the rest? So the rest is going to be return. And we'll, now we're going to sum up stuff. And we're going to say fib n minus 1 plus fib n minus 2. And that's it. And so now, um, let's try it. So let's say, what is the fib of 8? That's right. Because if you look here, fib of 8 is 21, right there. And if we go back, you know, what's the fib of 7? That's right. And finally, well, let's do just one more for good measure. Yep, that all seems to be correct. So it is working, OK? And so now let's try the base case. Fib of 1 is 1, and the fib of 0 is 0. Perfect. So we got it. So, um, so next class, we'll try and apply these, uh, this concept of recursion to something we'll do graphically in FLTK. I hope you enjoyed the lesson. See you next time.